just me and Bob. And we powered your it's, rackets. I uh, got busted yesterday. Tennessee. Who's it? Who do you have winning the whole thing? I got uh, Arizona winning the whole thing. All right. We lost Baylor in the final four, too. So. Yep. Basketball. Yeah. All that. Basketball. I'll let you I used to do it. Well, the Bears about Mark Kelly won't say anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our family does it, so it's like for bragging rights. Oh. So I was, I was in first place until yesterday. <laughs> I thought they got broke for all the games there. What's that? You were first place before all the games. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I declared myself. All right, welcome. I think we probably can get started here. Let's begin with a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word and how you use your word to share with us and reveal to us who you are and what you have done and promised to do for us through your son. We ask you to bless us as we continue our study of Jesus, finding Jesus in the Old Testament. May we find wonderful things in your word so that we can apply them to our lives and increase our trust in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Okay, so just a, a brief kind of recap, maybe, of what we've gone through so far and, and where we're going. Um, the Bible that Jesus read, that's what we looked at last week. Uh, just a reminder that Jesus didn't have a New Testament. Neither did um, John or Peter or Paul. They didn't have a New Testament. They wrote the New Testament a lot of them. Um, so it's the Old Testament scriptures that they were referring to. Today, what we're going to look at is Christophanies, which is a fancy word for appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. We'll see, check uh, out some examples of that. And then uh, going forward, sketches of the Savior. So we'll look at Old Testament people whose lives and actions foreshadowed what Christ would do. And the tabernacle, we'll look at that closely because that teaches us about Christ and what he was was going to accomplish for us. It's furnished for atonement. And then finally, your Savior and the Psalms. We'll look at the hymn book from the Old Testament. Um, so see what you remember from last week. Remember the Tanakh? There were the three, it's a threefold division of the Old Testament um, that the, the division that the Jewish people made. Um, do you remember what they are? What's the first one? Torah. All right, the Torah. And the Torah means? Teachings. Teachings, right. Often is translated the law, but really a better translation is, is the teachings of God because it contains both law and gospel. There's some sheets over there, Stacey. She had to point out that you walked in. <laughs> Can I blame Heath Butler? Everyone on the camera. This is live. That's that's not live. This be a tape, though. Okay, next one. Nevi'im. Nevi'im. Yeah. What is what does that refer to? It's the prophets. That's the prophets. Um, and not strictly just the prophets, but prophetical books too, like. Joshua is considered a prophetical book. First and Second Samuel. Um, so sometimes we think of those as historical books, but uh, according to this uh, designation, they would fall under the prophetical books. And then the last one. Oh, Chuck and Chuck, Chuck and them. Good try. That's <laughs> a tough one. <laughs> the main song. Ketu, Ketuvim. Yeah, the writings. So that would be like Psalms and Proverbs. And we noted how um, really it all starts with the, the Torah, the first five books of Moses. And everything else that's written after the Torah is really uh, building on that foundation. Um, one author has said that it's really inspired application of the Torah. So the prophets are inspired application of the Torah. So are the writings. Um, so I have the little arrows. And then that also then becomes true in the New Testament as well. Right? So the New Testament goes back to the Old Testament. And you can see that in quotes. 
and in imagery, uh, different things like that. Um, and they go all the way back to the Torah. The Torah is the most quoted uh, section of the Old Testament in the New Testament. All right? Any questions so far? That's just really good. We talked about the interconnectedness of the Bible. Uh, this is that graphic, Stacy, you showed me once several years ago, I think, and I found it again. So just that how all the books of the Bible are, are intertwined, and you're going to find, we talked about those two fancy words, um, intertextualization, right? <laughs> which is a made-up word that means that they're all connected, and that's when something from, let's say, from a later text borrows language or imagery from a previous text or more than one generally. We looked at the transfiguration as an example of that. And then metalepsis was that other one, right? And that was usually, it's like a phrase that reminds you of something that was said in the past. And then you look at the past story and that gives you context and helps explain further the new the new story. So we looked at uh, Moses at the burning bush and Joshua being called, right? And in both of them, in the Joshua account, it says, take off your sandals for the ground you're standing on is holy ground, which is the Old Testament reading is the Moses version of that. But that that's the tip-off, right? And we go back to the Moses story, and then we find out that the one who's speaking to Joshua is really the same one who's speaking Okay, Let's see where we're at here. Procreation of Bethlehem. So, on your sheet, you have a question. If you ask the average Christian, when was the first time Jesus shows up in the Bible, what answer do you think that you'd get most of? When you're in the end. Okay, in Bethlehem, that's what Cindy's saying too? Okay, yeah. At the manger, that's when when Jesus shows up. He's always been God, but he shows up in Bethlehem. Um, oh, okay. Good morning, Madeline. But our study today is going to show us that that's not entirely accurate. I would say that I bet that's the answer that you get most often. What answer might you give? When does Jesus first show up on the pages of the Bible? Oh, Genesis 3, the striking the heel. Okay, the first promise of the Savior. Okay, that's that's going way back. Right from the beginning. All right, so you're tapping into John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or was with God, and the Word was God. Yep, John's going back to Genesis 1. Yeah, so Rip, were you going to say a different one? The men that came to visit Abraham, one was Jesus. Yeah, one of them was the Lord, yeah. was the Lord. Yeah, two angels and and the Lord. Okay? That's in Genesis also. So, way before Bethlehem, right? So, when we're studying the Old Testament, Christ in the Old Testament, we're starting at creation, and we're going through to the birth of Jesus. Now, this gets to the second um, question on your sheet. It's, it's like a riddle. Is the future in front of you or behind you. I want you to take 30 seconds to contemplate that. Is the future in front of you or behind you? 30 seconds. in front of you or behind you? 
I would say all, because um, since creation, um, since God created created the earth in Genesis, that would lead up to the future. Um, you take like um, Isaiah when uh, it described it described Jesus, the way he would come in thorns, the way he would be crucified. So I, I, I think one results in the other. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? What do we say normally? We're facing the future, right? Put the past behind you, right? So the future is in front of you. But if you were a Hebrew, you wouldn't talk like that. Because in Hebrew, the word that means uh, in front of can also mean past. And the word that means um, future, there's two words that mean future, can also mean behind or at the back. And that really kind of makes more sense when you think about it because you can't really see your future, can you? But you can see your past. And that informs you about the future. So the Hebrew way of thinking would be that, that you are looking back at the past and your past is going to inform you about the future. Or if we're talking about, if we're trying to figure out or find out information about um, Jesus and who is this one who's born in Bethlehem, we really start, if you're a Hebrew, you start in Genesis and you walk back. Genesis to Bethlehem. So think of that in the Bible, right? So you're starting at, at creation and you're walking backwards and boom, there's hints here, and there's hints here. Oh, there's an appearance of Jesus here and here, here. And by the time that the back of your legs hit the manger in Bethlehem, you've been seeing all these different pictures or appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament that give you an idea of who he is. Does that make sense? Sort of? Kind of? Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're walking backwards from from creation to, uh, to Bethlehem. So we're going to preview the incarnation. Remember that's a fancy word for coming in the flesh. So we would say that happened at Bethlehem, right? When Jesus took on human flesh. But this is a preview of the incarnation because it wasn't really the first time that that happened where Jesus took on uh, the appearance of a human being. So let's look at the first section, the image of God. Um, on your sheet it says, compare Genesis 1, 26 and 27 with 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Uh, I have these three passages on your, on the screen. Bob, do you mind reading that? Uh, Bob, how do you? And God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and all over the creation creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. All right. So we, we remember that from creation week, right? The sixth day of creation. And... Uh, Really, the crown of God's creation is creating mankind uh, in his own image. Next passage, let's take the other Bob, 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. All right. The God of this age is talking about the devil. Okay. Um, but you see the, the phrase image of God here, and it's attached to Jesus. Last one. Uh, Jeff, you want to take this one? Colossians 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, or rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him.
now all things hold together. Okay, thank you. All right. So three passages, one Old Testament, two New Testament, that all speak of the image of God. The question on your sheet is, what is the connection between Christ as the image of God and Adam and Eve being made in the image of God? You see a connection. Bob? Well, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were perfect. Okay. Just as Jesus is perfect. Just as Jesus is perfect. Okay. Any other connections? What does it really mean that they were, I mean, so they were perfect. Maybe we can go a little bit further. That You're saying, Bob, that that's what it means by the image of God. Well, originally I had me were created holy. Without sin. Without sin. And what was their purpose, could we say, if they're made in the image of God? To look like him. Okay, so like when you meet Adam and when you meet Eve, it's like you're meeting God, right? They're a, they're a reflection, we could say maybe, of the character of God. That's what they did. Okay. Yeah, so... That's simple. That's so... I think the easiest way to think of that is these people are going to reflect my character. And so what God says is good, what God says is evil, they're going to, they're going to reflect that too. And he wanted them to do that. Now, Genesis 3 comes along and the fall into sin. And now, that's not, now you don't run into a human being and say, all right, um, boy, you're just, you're so godlike, <laughs> right? Um, Sometimes it's more like you're more devil like. Okay? But, so I guess the point being that, that Adam and Eve were meant to express the will of God as human beings in his created world. They fell short of that. They fell, they fell into sin. Um, and so none of their normal <clears throat> descendants would be able to, to carry that out either. But Christ is the ultimate image of God. Um, who is here to reflect the character of God in everything that he did and in everything that he said. Um, and he carried that out properly and completely. So what Adam and Eve failed to do, Christ did. So, so when he walked on this earth and when he talked, he was a perfect reflection of the will of his Father. Okay? So this whole idea, I'm going to give a Luther quote here since we're a Lutheran church. Luther writes in his Genesis commentary that in saying that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, Moses wanted to intimate dimly, that means him, that God was to become incarnate in the flesh because he was created in the image of the invisible God. That statement is a dim intim intimation as we shall hear, that God was to reveal himself to the world in the man of Christ. These seeds, as it were, of the very important facts the prophets have carefully gathered from Moses and himself. So you see what he's, that's kind of the second question there, in what way is the creation of humanity a prophecy of the incarnation? That's sort of what Luther's saying there, right? That this is like a hint of what is to ultimately come. And it's just a hint, but the prophets picked up on that, and so when they wrote their scrolls, um, there's different things that they have in their uh, scrolls that identify God as a human being or God incarnate. Does that bring up questions or comments? All right, now we're going to look at some examples of that. And maybe the most um, popular one is this one, a review of the preview of the incarnation. The angel or the messenger of the Lord. Um, Malak is the, the Hebrew word. And it can be translated either 
angel or messenger. In the, in the New Testament, that's, that's true as well. And probably the best translation is messenger. Like, go first with messenger. Maybe it's talking about, you know, what we consider or know to be angels, but many times it, it can also be something different. A messenger of the Lord. Even human beings or regular folks like us could be described as angels because we're messengers of God. Okay? So the messenger of God, we're going to look at some examples of where he shows up in the Bible. We've looked at this one already, Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 6. And I do have this one on, on your sheet. I'm not going to have everything up on your sheet. Um, but I do have this one. So, here, as I'm going to read through this, and I want you to um, jot down, maybe behind where it says read Exodus 3, um, what names or designations are used to establish the one in the burning bush. Okay, so as, as this section refers to the one in the burning bush, what names are given uh, to the, the one in the burning bush as he approaches the throne? So lay your way here, Dan. Thank you. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord, okay, there's the reference there, the Malach, the messenger of the Lord, appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, what the bush, or why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. All right, how many things did you find there? Holy ground. Okay, holy ground means says something about the the angel or the messenger of the Lord, huh? That he brings holiness. Is that what you're saying? God of Abraham, and there's the God of Isaac. Okay, so it kind of taps into Israel's history, right? The same God who, if you think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can think of God coming to Abraham and giving his promise that through you, all people on the earth will be blessed. The ultimate promise of the Savior coming from him. And he repeated that to Isaac and to Jacob as well. What else? Okay, angel or messenger of the Lord. The fact that it's otherwise impossible for a bush to not burn up when it's involved in flames. Okay, so that's giving a hint that this is something abnormal going on or supernatural going on. Okay, what else? What else is he called? Yeah, later I am, but then when the Lord saw him. So first he's the messenger of the Lord. Now he's the Lord who saw him. And what does he say at the end? At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Not afraid to look at the messenger of God, necessarily. I'm afraid to look at God. So here we have this angel of the Lord who is sent by God, representing God, and yet is called Yahweh, or the Lord. And he's called God as well. The other thing maybe to point out in verse 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Um, that could be translated, appeared could be, um, became seen by him. So became visible to Moses. So at first he just sees this fire. But then um, this is this is where the angel, the messenger of the Lord, is going to become visible to Moses. All right. So this is a 
this is a hint. This is a, a physical um, appearance of the messenger of the Lord in the Old Testament, who is called the messenger, but he's also called the Lord at the same time. So he's not just a messenger. He's not just an angel like we think of as a normal angel. All right. Um, let's look at any questions there. Let's look at the next section. This is Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 23. Now, I used to used to think that um, the answer to appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament were uh, when it says, the angel of the Lord. Have you ever heard that? Right? When it says, the angel of the Lord, that's talking about Jesus. Pre-incarnate Christ, before he came as the babe of Bethlehem. Um, this one doesn't say the angel of the Lord. But let's let's do some detective work. Okay, uh, Wayne, do you want to read this one? Sure. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way, and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion, since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say. I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. All right, good job with the names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so initially, it's I. So this is this is after. Um, the Mount Sinai encounter, right? The Ten Commandments have been given. That's Exodus chapter 20. And now, what do they do after that? They're going to head toward the Promised Land. And so this is God speaking about what's going to happen. How's that going to work? Um, so I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way. Uh, on your sheet, the question is, what God-like qualities are attributed to God's messenger in this section? Remember, angel, just think to yourself, messenger. God-like qualities. My name is in him. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next question. But God's name is in this this messenger. He's going to guard them and lead them or bring them to the place. Okay, so he's the one who's going to guide them to the promised land. But be the enemy, um, so they're enemies. All right, so he'll take care of. You know, when they went into the promised land, it's not like it was vacant, right? There was a lot of people there who didn't really care for the Israelites coming um, to take the promised land. And so they had many enemies. But here it's saying that my angel will go ahead of you and bring you, bring you into that land. And you're going to be able to settle there, even though you have enemies. Wait. Listen to him. Do what he says. Do not rebel against him. Okay, God-like quality. More literally, pay attention would be obey him. Obey him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is um, So you listen to him like you would listen to God. And he has the ability to absolve sins. Like God absolves sins. Right? Um, he will not forgive rebellion. So he, he has that control of, of forgiveness, offering forgiveness or not offering forgiveness. All right, now the second question deals with um, what Kathy talked about a little bit. When the Lord says, for my name is in him, what does this mean? Talking about, yeah, I mean, what does that what does that imply that that God's messenger has God's name in him? Yeah, we got to trust in the angel. Okay, yeah. The messenger. So if you're trusting the angel, in the angel, then you do the same for the angel. Yeah, we're messing up from that. Okay. Bob, were you going to add something more? Well, in catechism, it's the name. 
name of God is everything he calls us about himself. As you allude to the reputation. Yeah. Um, so therefore, everything God has revealed about himself can be found in this message. Okay? I'm thinking that he, um, the angel has the word of God within him and the, and the spirit of God within him. Yeah. What it doesn't mean is like, I've scribbled my name on this messenger, you know, and he's my property. I own him, you know, like you might do with your backpack or something like that, or for your lunch bag. You got to do that here. People can steal your lunch. You got to put your name on it. Um, and it doesn't even mean like the the priest in the Old Testament would have um, devoted to the Lord or dedicated to the Lord or written across his forehead. So it was like you know he was carrying out his duties um, because God had given him this position as high priest and he was devoted to the Lord as he carried out that service. Um, means more than that. It means that his word and really himself is actually in this message. So God's in this message. Okay. Thirdly, third question there, how does Hebrews 1 verse 3 reflect this Old Testament picture of the messenger this one you're going to have to look up. Can't do all the work. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Judges 13, 9 through 23. 
So read it on your own. Discuss among your table mates, and then we'll readdress it.
going to be like a wild donkey. He's going to be roaming around. He's going to live in hostility. So it's not really a blessing to him that, is it? No, it's t it's talking about this is what's going to happen for the future. Um, so it's a prom It's still a promise, right. right? Not the kind that we'd like to get, right? Why does it say he has heard of your misery and then? Oh, and like try and comfort her with this. <laughs> that, that's good, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're gonna have a wild donkey of a son. <laughs> Yeah, they have different names for that. He said that to us today, though. He tells us we're going to have hardship in the world, but he has overcome the world, right? Like, it's kind of the same. Yeah, that's... It's not, it's not all unicorns and rainbows on the third, right? A, yeah, great point. I mean, he, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, mm -hmm. uh, but don't be afraid, I've overcome the world, right? So you could say that's sort of what the, the messenger of the Lord is sharing with, with Hagar, um, you're going to have trouble. You know, your son's going to have trouble. But I'm the one, who, and she recognizes this. He's, he's the Lord who sees me. So he he's still going to be watching over me. And we say that too, right? When we're going through the trouble that we go through in this world, that we recognize that the Lord sees us. Um, and will see us through that too. Bob, were you, who was, yeah. Well, want to steal too much of Pastor's out of thunder, but if you were not in the first service, he did refer to Jesus as the God who comes down. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what Stacy was alluding to, too, I think. He's not this far away God, but the God who comes down and meets us in our misery, right? And he visited her. Because she would have been she would have been wondering about her future, right? Because um Sarah's going to get pregnant too, and, and Isaac's going to be the favorite. Isaac is the favorite son, right? And that's the one through whom the promise of the Savior comes. Um, so she wasn't going to have the benefits that Sarah was going to have, you know, as the wife of, of Abraham moving forward. All right. All right, let's do the judges one. This is, this is kind of a curious one. You were saying that as you were reading. Um, what do we learn about the messenger of God in Judges chapter 16? So in Judges, just a little context here. This is, you know, the, the book of Judges, this is they're in the promised land, and there's this cycle that, that seems to keep on happening. The people rebel against God, and then there's repression by some enemy. God allows an enemy to take them over. Then they repent of their sins, and then God sends a rescue, which we call a judge. And that's so that pattern just, you know, then they, they get this rescuer and everything, just a little time of peace, and then they they start rebelling against the Lord again. And that whole cycle happens again. So this is um, the angel of the Lord appearing to who what's going to be the mother of Samson, uh, the super strong judge. The hippie judge <laughs> with muscles. <laughs> um, okay, so what did you learn though about the messenger in that section? Messenger is telling uh, the mother not not to serve anything else, um, um, prevented or um, or any any anything that's um, unclean. Okay. Also to um, honor the um, angel of the Lord with honor. Okay, so first of all, giving directions on how she's supposed to live. Okay, and then showing proper honor toward the, the angel of the Lord. Are you getting that from the the sacrifice that they were going to give? The burnt offering. The burnt offering, yeah. Okay. What else? Wayne. Well, when he asked him his name, he said, my name is beyond understanding. You know? Okay. To uh, indicate they, they, they're, they're dealing with something a lot bigger than what they thought. Okay. I, yeah. I was kind of, this, to me, I was, as I was reading, it was like a little mini story of Jesus. He appeared as a man, 
and that his words, uh, you know, have to will be fulfilled. Things will be forgiven. Give the offering for thanks to God. Don't feed me. And that my name is beyond your understanding. And then he ascended in the flame. You know, he ascended to God, and what they, what he showed them, is what's to come. Yeah. That's yeah. I think I think you're going to invite a little bit too much into it, but... Well, that's, we're going to cover that a little bit next week with the, the whole sketches of the Savior, like these... Sometimes people's lives are like... Or an appearance like this could be a mini picture of what is to come. Um, any other thoughts? I, I have a couple of verses that I'd like you to look at. If you look at verse 16... Um, the angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. And then it says, Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. So apparently, you know, there wasn't this halo over his head. It wasn't a flaming bush, you know, like with Moses. This He looked pretty ordinary that Manoah didn't even recognize that you're talking to the Lord. And then if you look at verse 20, um, this is what Kathy was just talking about. As the flame, flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Uh, seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. So, they didn't realize this was the angel of the Lord, that this was actually the Lord, right? Because then he goes on, verse 22, we're doomed to die. We have seen God. So there's a recognition that this angel of the Lord is God. And yet, he didn't look much like God, like they didn't know he was God. For, for much of that time, until he ascended up in the flame. Which... Kathy kind of matches what you were saying too, right? People didn't recognize Jesus as God. All right. Let's jump to uh, the next section. I'll just... Genesis 48 is Jacob blessing his son Joseph. And I'll give you the answers to this because we're short of time. Um, how do Jacob's words concerning the Malach or the messenger of the Lord describe Jesus? Um, he calls the angel of the Lord. Um, he has been my shepherd throughout my life. And then also refers to him as he's redeemed me from trouble. So he's a shepherd and a redeemer. Which would match what we would say. We could say the very same thing about Jesus. Okay, so that's the Moloch, the messenger of the Lord. I just wanted to get into this next section. And that's the word of the Lord, preview of the incarnation still. So let's look at um, Genesis 15, 1 through 6. Let's, do the, let's split them up again because we're running short. So um, Madeline, on over, you have Genesis 15, 1 through 6. And Jeff, on over this way, you guys get 1 Samuel 3, 1 and 10. And you're going to read through this again on your own. And then there's, there's certain questions underneath each one. Um, for the Genesis one, identify how the word Abram encountered was more than a spoken word. And then Samuel, similar, what human actions or features does the divine word take on that indicate this was more than a sound from heaven?
dorm in it? Yes. Okay. escorted Abram outside. As, look at the stars. If you can count them, you can count your descendants. So it's not just, I always thought, boy, you know, when the word of the Lord came to these people, it's like, whoa! You know, you just hear this word of the Lord. But this indicates that uh, somebody walking alongside of him, right, saying, maybe taking him by the elbow and saying, come on out here, I want to show you something. Take a look. Now. He came in a vision. Right something you can see. Yeah. It's not just an ear event, it's an eye event. Very good. Okay. I, those are the main things that I thought of from Genesis 15. The point being that, that the word that is spoken is not just something that you is audible, but it's something that you see. This, I think, the first Samuel chapter 3, 1 through 10, uh, kind of a familiar story. Where the Lord, where the Lord comes to Samuel. Remember, Samuel's that the young child that Hannah, who had, wasn't able to have children, prayed to the Lord, and uh, Lord gave her this son, and she de dedicated her son to the Lord, and so took him to um, the Lord's house, and he ministered there under Eli the priest. And at this point, chapter three, the word of the Lord comes to Samuel, and Samuel. Samuel, remember that story? And then, here I am, right? Um, so the question you're supposed to deal with here is, what human actions or features does the divine word take on that indicate this is more than a sound from heaven? Did you find that? So the Lord came yeah, verse, that's verse 10, isn't it? So he calls twice. Samuel hears him calling twice, and then... In verse 10, uh, the word or the Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel says, Speak for your servant. So he stood. He's standing there, calling out Samuel's name. It's not just this voice from heaven uh, that's coming, it's a voice that is a visible voice. That can, and came and stood there could also mean presented himself there. Like, here I am. And earlier it talks about how Samuel didn't really know the Lord because there weren't many visions at that time or, or the word the Lord had not been revealed to him. That could be mean in this way. Not that he just not that he didn't know who the Lord was, but that the Lord had not been revealed to him in this intimate way um, as the word in the flesh. All right. 
blows your mind a little bit, right? Um, but it's kind of interesting. You, you read through these texts a little bit closer and you see these little hints of, as I jotted down this uh, quote from a Bible commentary, Christ enjoyed trying on the clothes of the incarnation. <laughs> like a dress rehearsal, he's doing it here and there in a variety of ways in the Old Testament. So that when you are walking backwards to Bethlehem and you, the back of your legs bump into the manger, you're not so shocked to hear John say in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so it makes, you know, perfect sense. Okay? We're uh, at the end of our time. Or next time you have a little for further study. If you'd like to, you know, do this a little bit more, uh, I ask when is when would most people say Jesus first appeared on the scene? And uh, you guys did get the creation as the word, right, being spoken. If you in this further study part, if you look at Proverbs chapter eight, verses twenty-two through thirty-one. And then compare that with John 1 and some other passages from the New Testament. You, you should see a connection. Um, Proverbs 8 speaks about wisdom. And it speaks about wisdom personified. And it speaks about wisdom being there at the beginning. And even existing before. The so that's a little further study you can do. And then next time we'll look at some sketches of the Savior. So the lives of people. Um, in the Old Testament that are kind of a shadow or a foreshadowing of what Jesus is. Doing.